This is an invisible disease until it becomes really visible. We don't want to get to that stage, right? And we want to get treated as soon as possible to avoid those late complication in terms of mobility that we are all aware of and also all the other cardiovascular risk, etc. That was Dr. Ali Karam. He is chair of the Canadian Spondylitis Association, a patient-led, not-for-profit organization focused on advocacy for Canadians living with spondyloarthritis. He is a self-described ankylosing spondylitis warrior, advocating as both a physician and a patient living with spondylitis. He's currently completing his family medicine residency at the University of Ottawa. He's our guest on this episode of Around the Room. Welcome back to all our listeners. I'm Daniel Ennis. Janet Pope is out for this episode. Looking ahead, we have some really exciting episodes coming up, including Sjogren's disease and a Clinical Pearls episode. If you have questions you'd like answered by the experts, please contact us through the CRA. The Twitter account is at CRASCRroom or by email info at room.ca. For our Clinical Pearls episodes, please get in touch if you have challenging cases you want to present on the podcast. I know you have good cases out there, so send them our way. Okay, now on to our guest, Dr. Eli Karam. Welcome to the show. Hello, Daniel. Thanks for the invite. Of course. It's so nice to see you. So to get us started, I'd like to hear about where you are in your training and what drew you to that line of work. Yeah, absolutely. Currently, I'm a family medicine resident at the University of Ottawa. I was previously an orthopedic surgery resident in Quebec City. I was doing my residency there. I did almost four years of orthopedic surgery, and that is when I started having my first flares, my diagnosis. And um, after that, I started my treatments and that that came this is exactly when also I decided that I needed to respect my physical limitation and switch to family medicine at that point which is uh, basically which was basically a choice that is more flexible in terms of quality of life and respecting the limitations of my physical disease How has that transition been from a surgical specialty to a family practice, which has a very different kind of dominion and point of view and and scope of practice? How have you managed with that adjustment? Yeah. So first of all, I consider myself very lucky, Daniel, because first of all, I'm I responded to treatments. That's that was a that was a miracle, right? It was a night night to day change for me. At a certain point in time, I was not able to do the simplest thing, really, just moving or putting on my pants or having a short walk. So, I mean, I'm really grateful for the treatment and thankful for that and thankful that I get to practice medicine still. Now, for sure, it's a big change for me in terms of surgery versus uh, family medicine, but I got to learn so much in orthopedic surgery in terms of skills, but also in terms of leadership, communication, collaboration. So I'm trying to put all these skills, knowledge, competencies that I've learned and apply them to family medicine. And one of the biggest passions and drive that I have is really to bring awareness about my disease in a field like family medicine, where a family physician is really a great health advocate and can really drive change. So I'm really hoping to do that. Big ambitions. Hopefully I'll get there someday. Absolutely. You know, that's that's an interesting thing you point out that, you know, because family doctors see so many patients and, you know, 99% of the back pain that's that's cared for by physicians in general is probably cared for by family doctors with only a small subset actually ever getting to a rheumatologist. I, I really think of family doctors as very much you know, their own experts on, on back pain and back disease. And with your orthopedics background, you, you really are going to have, uh, you know, quite an interesting um, scope of practice when it comes to uh, back pain and other MSK concerns. You know, y- you have a really interesting journey to tell, and I'm hoping that you can kind of take us back to the beginning and bring us along with you and, and tell us about how you kind of got to where you are now. So this is like the the five years earlier sort of part of the episode where we jump back in time. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, so I can I can start by telling you like just a bit about me in terms of background, because at the end uh, of the day, my background um, and my past did after all shape who I am today. So just for fun, my uh, I'm actually I'm actually Lebanese. I grew up in the center of the Lebanese capital uh, in a very francophone neighborhood called Ashrafi. And I, sur- I survived many hardships um, and I was really lucky. That's why you always hear me say that I'm a proud Lebanese, but I'm the most grateful Canadian you'll ever meet because of what Canada really offered me in terms of opportunities. I know it's not perfect, but we can do something about it. Uh, and a fun fact, I actually completed a certificate in immunology with absolutely no interest whatsoever uh, in immunology. I was really just after this girl who didn't turn out to be my girlfriend uh, and not, not my wife, not even my girlfriend. So anyways, uh, after, after that, I was lucky. I got to complete my medical education at the University of Sherbrooke and joined the team of orthopedic surgery at the University of Laval in Quebec City. And during my residency, I got to become a husband and a father to a little princess. That was also when I started having those flares. So it came after a squash game. I'm very competitive in nature. So I love to win. I was after this impossible ball to save. And I fell on my back. I thought, "Eh, that's just a contusion or a sprain will go away but it didn't it really took me more than three months before getting through that first episode and when I woke up the next day I can tell you I felt really really old like super old hot showers definitely helped but the most predominant thing was the pain so at first I thought it was a mechanical back pain But then slowly started having those inflammatory features. It would wake me up at night. I would start having back pain going from my back to my first stall. So I thought to myself, for a certain reason, I must have a herniated disc now. So I'm going to do what I tell my patients to do. Work on the core, the six packs. (laughs) Well, it didn't work. And after six weeks, that pain that was on the left started on the right. And what followed was a completely unpredictable series of completely inflammatory type of flares in my ankle, my neck, my shoulders. So some days people would see me totally functional and some other days you would see me unable to do the simplest things like putting on my pants or having a short walk. So a lot of confusion, anger, sadness. So at that point, not knowing what I had really like killed me. And what killed me the most was not being able to perform at my best. At at some point in time, it was even difficult with my wife, even though she was a family medicine resident back then. It was difficult for her to understand that at certain moments, I couldn't get intimate with her. So she thought that I might be rejecting her or even worse, cheating on her. And like many with a disease, I'm pretty sure a lot of physicians understand that we become addicted to NSAIDs, anti-inflammatory drugs, and they become my, our best friends. And I can tell you, uh, I tried all sorts of braces. I didn't put the braces because they relieved my pain in any way, not at all. The main reason I put those braces was because I wanted to avoid getting asked too many questions. On why, for example, I was limping that day. Or why, for example, I couldn't move my head too much that day. So, thankfully, I had a very empathic family physician that listened to me and tried to understand what was happening to me. And I was not an easy diagnosis because all my markers were, were negative. The B27, the CRP, the X-ray center on the lumbar spine, negative. So I was part of that 10% that were all negative. And thankfully, my wife um, actually followed her 45-minute lecture on AXPA. And she kind of forced me to 
ask for an MRI center on the SI joints. And this is when I got my diagnosis, non-radiographic AXPA. Thank God that I listened to her. So guys out there, if you're hearing me, the point here, listen to your wives. (laughs) I, I think, uh, as per usual, uh, family doctors are, are just some of the, the smartest people on the planet. So um, good advice there. You, you really touched on, on a number of really important items here. And, and I'm going to kind of ask you to comment on a couple of them. One of them was that the early kind of emotional impact of the symptoms. You went from being, and, and you still are, I'm sure, but... It, when your symptoms are active, you go from being this competitive, high-functioning, high-performing, hard-working person with a family to take care of. And and I can you kind of elaborate on the emotional impact of having those things kind of taken away or diminished by, by the symptoms at that time? Absolutely. Such an important component. Um, a huge majority of patients deal with that, and I, I had to deal with it too. At a certain moment, you start thinking because of the character of the pain that is completely intermittent and unpredictable. You're like, what's happening with me? Is it in my head? Am I faking it? Am I faking being sick? Well, this is what I usually tell my patients and clients and basically my colleagues and our volunteers at CSA is that you're not faking being sick. You're actually faking being well, which is completely (laughs) the opposite. We're trying to say that we're fine, even though we're not. And that's one of the major problems that is driving that delay to diagnosis because patients are afraid to ask for help. They go to their family physician and suddenly they're okay. They're fine. You're like, yeah, today I'm okay, doc. But yesterday I couldn't do anything really like believe me. And they're confused. They don't know how to advocate for themselves. So what I usually like, what we usually tell them to do and what what I did for myself was I put it in a journal. I needed to put this, I need to put this data in a journal to make sure that like, to, to understand that this is not just something that I'm imagining. This is real. This is real life. How many days per week are you going through that pain? How many days per week were you not able to do your usual tasks, Mm -hmm. document this, put it somewhere, and then go speak to your physician. You know, I I think interplaying with this to a degree is, is how visible the disease is. And you remarked that sometimes you would wear a back brace, not because you thought it was helping, or you knew it wasn't. But it it was that it it kind of just was a, a bit of a visual indicator to people that things weren't perfect for you, that that things were awry. And I wonder about this sometimes for patients is it's really hard to have a disease that people cannot see. And while no one wants to have a disease that you can see, it kind of, I, I, I think it may interplay in some way with that kind of the psychologic emotional torment that the disease causes. Uh, what do you feel about that? Absolutely. I mean, this is an invisible disease until it becomes really visible. We don't want to get to that stage, right? So we want to make it as visible as possible and as fast as possible. And we want to get treated as soon as possible to avoid those late complications in terms of mobility that we all, we are all aware of and also all the other um, cardiovascular risks, etc. So, yes, I mean, there's a big dilemma into making that disease visible. Not easy. It's a fight. And this is why at CSA, we're really trying to raise the voice to and help patients better advocate for themselves by Mm -hmm. empowering them with tools, disease awareness campaigns, some coaching sessions, support groups. They need to feel validated and they need... I mean, we need, I needed someone to tell me that I'm not alone in this. Mm -hmm. This is not just happening in my head. It's real. So the first step, I guess, is for us to acknowledge that it's real. 
and to understand that it's real, to confirm that it's real. Such a big relief for patients. And then this is when the process of us accepting the disease and moving forward can take place. And this is where a huge part of the mental health struggle can actually decrease. Now, for sure, chronic pain is not something easy to deal with. Even if you have a diagnosis, chronic pain can still really have a huge impact on your mental health. This is why you need to be treated with a multidisciplinary team. You need multiple players in your team and you need to be ready to ask for help. We're not supposed to be perfect. We're just human beings. We need each other. I think that's a good uh, segue into um, talking about the multidisciplinary team and, and the healthcare professionals that you interacted with. I'm wondering if you can kind of walk me through some of what was done well and what wasn't done well or what needs improvement in terms of your interactions with uh, healthcare professionals or moving through the system. Yeah, so I was lucky, right? I mean, even though it took me more than two years to get to the right diagnosis, I was lucky. I was surrounded by a family physician that was really empathic, even though she didn't know exactly what was happening with me. Yeah. At least she was listening. She was understanding and I felt heard. So that's that was a big win for me. At least there was someone that was kind of believing me, even though there wasn't any data to prove it. Is it always the same for all the patients that I hear about uh, with CSA? No. Is it something understandable? It could be understandable because of the character of the disease. Can we do better? Absolutely, we can do better. We can do better in terms of promoting better education uh, in with patients, giving them guidelines, this is what we're working on, giving patients guidelines on how to better advocate for themselves, what tests like to ask for when they go see their physician and how to speak with their physician and how to document what's happening with them. That's one. Two, in terms of physician education, for sure we can do better. We can do better at organizing or implementing new algorithm that are simple to use, especially when we think about a population that is young, less than 45 years old, with more, with more than three months of inflammatory back pain. We need to really be able to differentiate mechanical from inflammatory, and then it's easier for us to get to the next steps in terms of what to order. And that's another like struggle, another barrier for that delay to diagnosis in the system it's basically what to order. So we need those experts to come together and have some sort of a written algorithm or validated algorithm for primary care so that primary care can order the right tests. Mm -hmm. Not the test for RA, not the test for any other autoimmune disease or whatever. Three simple tests, at least at the beginning, CRP, X-ray on the X-ray of the lumbar spine, and B27. And if those are negative, maybe think about ordering an MRI center on the SI joints. Mm -hmm. So that's like there's an indication. I mean, probably to be done here to get better. Again, we're not perfect. It's all about improvement. And what really helped me also afterwards was getting in contact with my physio. I was, again, super lucky. I got a physiotherapist that was specialized in expo. She taught me exactly what I needed to know in terms of mobility, how to move, etc. And in my team, there was also a psychologist. There was also a health coach that really helped me better accept my disease and move forward. So this is why you also you also hear me um, talk about coaching and how passionate I am about that coaching approach because it's really about accepting your uh, something that is not easy to accept, especially mm -hmm. for young adults in their peak in the peak of their careers or women in their peak of their reproductive age. Um, so we need to do we need to do better. Um, mm -hmm. There's always room for improvement. We're lucky in Canada. We have a we have great experts leading the way, uh, specialized in expo. Hopefully, with the work 
with associations and all partners, we can basically drive that delay to diagnosis down and basically avoid patients years, years of completely unnecessary emotional, physical, professional, relational pain, really completely unnecessary. And especially avoid the worst complication of all, which is basically the spine rigidity and decreased mobility. As you know, NAS time is spine. So we need to do better. You know, you, you, you touch on some, some fascinating pieces there of the psychology of how we interact with patients and how patients interact with us. So the idea of equipping patients uh, with the tools to advocate for themselves when they see their family doctor, it, that's so interesting because, you know, I, I actually like when patients come to me with ideas on, on their care. But I, I think that you, you've probably seen this in your training and, and probably as a patient as well. I think doctors are often trained a little bit more as lone wolves and, and, you know, their expertise is, I think, I think all of us bring some degree of ego to it. The idea of being told what to do is a bit unusual in, in our line of work, as opposed to us knowing what to do. No, no, no. I'm the doctor. I know what's best. And, and you're flipping that model on its head a little bit by, by having the advocacy come from the patient and um, the direction and content expertise coming from the patient. And I think that's that's really fascinating. And similar to that is the idea that the multidisciplinary team is not just to help the you know the doctor reduce their workload. It is separate expertise in each of those different areas that is all complementary. So sure, the the physician plays a role in diagnosis and treatment, very important parts of of the care, no, no question about that. I'm not not arguing that, but that the the health coach, the psychologist, the you know the nurse or nurse practitioner, the physiotherapist, these are completely different disciplines that are complementary, and and that that's kind of what I'm hearing in your story is that w- we actually do need to be um, better at sharing the responsibility of content knowledge, diagnosis, management, all of these things are, are, are teamwork. Absolutely. I, I think physicians, I mean, the core competencies of CanMeds, uh, the new competency is leadership, right? Mm-hmm. As physicians, we need to be better leaders. And in order to be better leaders, I think we need to be surrounded by other leaders, Leaders in other fields also, nurses, physio, chiro, health coaches, whatever, you name it. And those can play such a great role, not only in treating patients, but also in driving that delay to diagnosis down. How? Well, studies are showing and our survey is showing and a big IMAS survey on AXPA is showing that on average, Patients are seeing two to three professionals, healthcare professionals, before getting diagnosed. And 50% of those professionals are physio, chiro, osteo. So we need to get them involved and they could actually help us drive this delay to diagnosis down. So absolutely. We'll be back to Around the Room in a minute after this brief message from the Canadian Rheumatology Association. The CRA wants to invite you to visit their website, room.ca, to participate in accredited virtual care modules. These are designed specifically for rheumatologists to learn and practice a standardized approach to virtual care. These resources are available exclusively to CRA members and invited guests. Access to the site is password protected. To get your password, please contact info at room.ca. This learning program is supported by an unrestricted educational grant from Novartis. An independent CRA scientific planning committee was responsible for the scientific integrity, objectivity, and balance of this content. And now, back to the podcast. 
So, you know, you've, you've touched on some tools that you're working on to help us get to the diagnosis faster, communicate about the disease better, and, and, and so doing kind of treating patients better in general. You know, skipping to the, the treatment phase of the disease, one thing I find is that the conversations about which medications are available, which ones do what, that's a hard conversation, I think, for some patients to kind of integrate all the information you're giving about side effects, benefits, uh, like the risk benefit. How do we better equip patients to start medications or to understand what we're, you know, what we're offering, what's on offer for them? How do we have that conversation better? Uh, this is such an important topic and a topic that is very dear to my heart. So I'll do two things. First, I'll share my story and how it went for me and how I basically went from a, an anti-inflammatory drug to a biologic. And then I'll share with you a couple of tools that we have at CSA that might also help patients and physicians drive this conversation forward and maybe in a better way and maybe equip them to have a better, I guess, informed decision-making. So in terms of my own decision-making, so what was going on is that was that I wasn't responding too well at a certain point in time after my diagnosis to the first line, which is basically anti-inflammatory drugs and sets. So I needed to take that decision on whether or not to go on a biologic. And for me, the risk was like more infection, uh, obviously working in a hospital setting, probably a bit more like cancer risk and injection every week. So for me, the reason to really go on a biologic, I mean, I got to that decision by going back to my values. And one of my biggest values is family. My wife was giving birth to my daughter at that time, so she needed help. She had a C-section and I wasn't able to help at all. And that really killed me. I was going overdose on NSAIDs. I wanted to be the best dad for my daughter I could be. So that is exactly when I took the decision not only to take the biologic, but also not to let pain or AS lead the way. So yes, I have AS, but AS does not have me. And it's important for patients to really, like going back to patients now, it's important to patients to really, first of all, understand what's important for them in their life. What are their values? What is, what is going on in their life? How much pain is really affecting their life and how much their disease is really affecting their lives? So going to all the spheres that really have an importance in their lives. So this is one. And putting it on paper or just seeing that clearly uh, in their head. So that's one. And two, going to basically all the side effects of the drug and all the inconvenience of taking a drug like that. And then balancing that with a physician and other healthcare providers that are so knowledgeable in that field. Example, nurses. They're, they know. They know. They're so good. Pharmacists that are specialist pharmacists, they know. They understand the risk. They can tell you exactly what it is. And one of the greatest tools that I'm so proud of that we will be launching with a new website of CSA is a risk assessment tool that we were able to develop with a pharmacist, Carolyn uh, Wiskin. She's a pharmacist, a specialist pharmacist that helped us develop that tool for patients. So when you go on that risk assessment tool, you can basically click on every side effect and see truly with evidence-based medicine, what's the frequency of it and what is exactly that side effect. And then you can put on that paper and go with uh, to your physician and balance that pros and cons and take your decision according to what is important to you. That's brilliant. You know, I, I think some people, there, there's, you know, patients of all different types and some want tons of information, some want medium amount, some want None. They want you to just tell them what to do. Hey, you're the doctor. Why are you asking me? And 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 there's a huge spectrum there. And and what a tool like that kind of allows you to do is use it or not use it. But if you use it, you can kind of hone in what what is really personally important to you in terms of side effects. It, you know, for some medications, some people a side effect that would really really bother them more than nausea 
might be hair loss. And maybe as a physician, that wouldn't be the first thing on your mind because you're like, oh, uh, what's the big deal? I'm bald, uh, <laughs> you know, but but for a patient that might be really central. So you get more personal control over, you know, discussion of side effects. I think that's that's really great. Um, You know, you've already given such a, a clear and uh, effective pitch for the Canadian Spondylitis Association. Where can... Uh, doctors and patients alike go to get this information? Yeah, so uh, thanks again for letting me talk about CSA. I mean, I think CSA could really play a great role in this continuum of care. Um, And I think this is exactly what this association should do. So anyone looking for information, how to basically uh, to educate themselves. Uh, In terms of patients, we don't want to go to Dr. Google. You sure. want to go to basically validated in, uh, validated information by top experts in the field. We're lucky to have a medical advisory committee led by Dr. Inman that is basically checking and verifying that everything that we're putting out there is real. It's evidence-based medicine. So that's like one. So anyone searching for information can just go to spondylitis.ca. This is where we provide um validated information, great resources for patients, not only with, for AS, but also PSA, juvenile, spa, and other, form, other forms of spondyloarthropathies. The great thing about CSA is also the support component. So there's a lot of support going on, peer-to-peer support, group support. There's coaching. There's recently yoga for AS, something That's I great. really love. Yeah. Two, we're basically partnered with two yogis from the UK that are providing us with a library of exercise for AS patients. So we can basically direct all the patients to this. Coming up, Tai Chi, art therapy. So a great support network. And not only for, again, I mean, it, it depends on the population. So now you have a young uh, AS group, you have mothers, you have dads, you have a francophone group. So it's pretty cool. Again, I mean, it's all about going and getting that emotional support and that common humanity part, reminding ourselves that we're not alone in this and we shouldn't have to do it alone. And uh, another very interesting thing about the website of the CSA and what we're doing is advocacy. It's completely ridiculous that we're one of the worst countries in terms of getting access to new innovative treatments. It's ridiculous that it takes five years to get access to those treatments, especially that in AS and in SPA, we tend to become resistant to these drugs after five years. We need to do better. And it's vital for us to have at least the option to get access to those medication. So we help patients better advocate for their medication, but also for other fight that they have to lead, unfortunately, with insurance, hospitals, workplaces, so many things. So again, I think CSA is a great ally in this continuum of care. So we have the, the physician, we have the nurse, we have the physio, we have the chiro. I don't want to forget anyone. Okay. We have a crew, huge team, and we're we're hopefully part of that team. Perfect. So Canadian Spondylitis Association, that's at spondylitis.ca. And just before we let you go, I'm always in search of a good recommendation. Any good book or podcast or TV show that you'd recommend? Oh, um, I'm a big reader. So one of my favorite books, I mean, one of the books that I'm reading right now is The One Thing, something I would definitely recommend for anyone uh, just focusing on that one thing that will make a huge difference in your life, uh, in your day, in your months, in your year is something amazing, something we can we, we should all be focusing on, especially now with everything with everything going on and all that distraction. That's like one thing that I would recommend right now. Brilliant. Dr. Eli Karam, thank you so much for coming on Around the Rim. Thank you so much, Daniel, for having me. It was a pleasure.
That's it for this episode of Around the Room. For questions, comments, and future episode ideas, email us at info at room.ca or tag our Twitter account with your question at C-R-A-S-C-R Room. Around the Room is produced by David McGuffin, Dr. Dax Rumsey, and Aaron Stewart. We would like to give a special thanks to the Communications Committee and the staff of the CRA for their hard work. And of course, an extra special thanks this week to our guest, Dr. Karam. Our theme music was composed by Aaron Fontwell. If you enjoyed your time with us, please give us a rating and subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. You can also share this podcast with your colleagues and spread the word on social media. I'm Daniel Ennis. Thanks so much for listening.